Okay, hello. So today I want to present general properties of derived prismatic homology. So I fix a prime P. And the key definition for this course is the definition of a prism. And the prism is a pair A comma I of a delta ring A and an invertible ideal I inside A such that uh, two properties are satisfied. So the first is that A is uh, derived uh, PI complete. And the second is that P lies in the ideal generated by I and the Frobenius of I. But actually this uh, condition is not the one that one should remember. It's just a cleaner way of expressing the following property. So after some localization, of A, more precisely an inter-risky localization, the ideal I is generated by some element D, such that delta of D is a unit. And here I'm using implicitly uh, the fact that the delta structure will automatically extend uniquely to such a localization. So then I want to give examples. And so the first one ties with the uh, topic from yesterday, namely it's the case where A is say P complete, P torsion free, and the ideal is generated by P. So that's the case of yesterday, and it's the so-called crystalline case. And so here, in order to check that this is a prism, one can note the following. So, uh, so what is delta of P? So delta of P is necessarily given by the following expression, P minus P to the power P over P, which is one minus P to the P minus one, which by P completeness is a unit in A. So, but why is this necessarily this, why does necessarily this equation hold? It just follows, say, from this additivity rule for delta or uh, the fact that like uh, the Frobenius of P is equal to P. Then a second example, which is, uh, which is very important for arithmetic, so following. So assume that uh, K is a perfect field and assume that A is a power series ring over the width vectors of K. And then uh, let us define a delta structure on that ring by requiring that U is um, uh, satisfied that delta of it is equal to zero, or equivalently, that phi of U is equal to U to the P. And so here I can note that this ring is P torsion free, and thus the delta structure is the same as a Frobenius lift, and this defines the Frobenius lift if we also extend it, uh, use the Frobenius on the width vectors of, of K. And then 
is the idea i. I want to take an idea generated by e of u, where e of u inside, say, the polynomials uh, in u is an Eisenstein polynomial. And so, let me, uh, yes. And so, how do we check that this uh, element satisfies this assumption that delta of t is a unit? So, what one can do is one can just mod out u, because that ring is theoretically complete, so something is a unit if and only if it's a unit modulo, modulo u. And then one notes that here, the constant term of an Eisenstein polynomial is uh, by definition a unit times p, but then one reduced to the first case where we checked that delta of p is a unit. Okay. This case is the so-called Broekhiesen case. And it's relevant for arithmetic for the following reason. Namely, if we consider a mod i, then this identifies with a ring of integers in a p-adic field. And so here, u maps to some uniformizer pi. And also conversely, given any ring of integers in, in a, in a p-adic field and the uniformizer, then uh, one can construct a prism A with this property by taking k to be the residue field of OK and then uh, setting EU as, um, as the minimal polynomial of a uniformizer over the maximal uh, unramified sub-extension. And if you choose different uniformizers, you get non-isomorphic prisms or, or possibly... Like the underlying... Uh, for the same yeah, ring of integers, if you change the, the, the presentation, you get different prisms. Yes. And also one uh, caveat of this construction is that it's not so clear how one can uh, say, um, given two ring of integers with a map between them, then usually this is not so clear how to lift this to a morphism of prisms or something. So. Uh, therefore, this presentation uh, is a bit, sometimes a bit difficult to work with. Okay, then I want to... Uh, so, so in this case, what's the third high u? Pardon? The third high u, right? Delta u was yeah, said to be... Uh, third high u is a, it's a, a unit. Uh, yes, but it's not so easy to write this down explicitly. It's easier to just check that it's a unit. Okay, then I want to mention another case, which is the so-called cyclotomic prism. And and so how is it defined? So the underlying delta ring is given by Zp and then power series in Q minus one. And the Frobenius on it again. Uh, sends uh, Q to Q to the P. But this time the ideal is generated by the Q analog of P, which is the expression Q to the P minus 1 over Q minus 1. So in other words, it's just the sum 1 plus Q plus Q to the P minus 1. And again, by a similar argument as in the second case, one checks that the delta of that element is um, uh, as a unit, just say by reducing modulo q minus 1. And in this case, a mod i is isomorphic uh, to zp adjoined uh, p root of unity by sending q uh, to zeta p. So zeta p, of course, is a uh, primitive p root of unity. And so, Uh, 
after discussing examples for PRISM, I want to just mention uh, some properties a PRISM could have. I'm reserve the following. Uh, so a PRISM is called bounded. If A mod I has bounded infinity to P infinity torsion, so that's um, very technically very convenient this property, and it, for example, implies that actually A is classically uh, PI complete. When um, this prism is called orientable. If I is principal, and in this case, an orientation of a prism is then also the, the, the uh, when an orientation of a prism I is when a choice of a generator for I. And you should note that uh, this property that I is generated by some element with the data of the unit passes to all generators. And when a prism is called perfect, if it's Frobenius, is an isomorphism, then a fourth property, the prism is called transversal, if A mod I is P torsion free, in other words, um, when P and I form a regular sequence, so are there some non examples of non orientable prisms? Somebody told me yes, <laughs> but I don't know any. Yeah, it is possible, it's a bit artificial, but I think Balgov, but well, anyway, I had some email and also I, I found some, anyway. It's, it's what's, uh, what's maybe a bit funny is that uh, this issue does not come up in, in any theorem that one wants to prove. I mean, it makes some arguments sometimes maybe more difficult, but then usually it's, uh, it's not an issue. When um, a morphism of prisms, so of course this means that A to B is a morphism of delta rings and I is mapped to the ideal J. This is called faithfully flat. If uh, the map A to B is uh, PI completely faithfully flat. So what does this mean? In other words, if uh, I take the derived reduction of a modulo pi, which is generated, which is given by some causal complex, then uh, this morphism of uh, animated rings to the derived reduction here is faithfully flat. Which means it is faithfully flat on pi zero, and the higher homotopy is a tensor ring right there. Exactly. Then I want to make a remark about the perfect prisms. Um, <clears throat> so actually, the bijectivity of the Frobenius puts some restrictions on the pos on the shape of a perfect prism. So, uh, namely. A comma I is perfect if and only if A is isomorphic to the uh, ring of P typical bit vectors for some perfect FP algebra.
and in this case, the ideal i is automatically principal and xi has an expression of the following form. So in general, it's given by some power series in P with coefficients given by Teichmüller lifts. And so now the requirements for the prism translate into the following, namely that R is A0 adequately complete. And the second condition, the delta of uh, D is a unit, translates into the condition that A1 is a unit in R. And so then, one can uh, show the following. So perfect prisms are equivalent to perfectoid rings. And so actually, one can take uh, this more or less as a definition. So what is the functor? So a perfect prism A comma I is just mapped to A mod I. And then a perfectoid ring here is sent to A inf of T, which is by definition the width vectors of uh, the tilt of uh, T. And then the ideal is given by the kernel of Fontaine's map theta. But for this course, actually, it's maybe easier to take the perfect prism as the definition of a perfectoid ring. And so now I can define the prismatic side in general. following uh, what uh, I've done yesterday. So there will be two cases. The first one is the so-called relative case. And so it works as follows. So we fix some bounded prism. And assume that R is an A mod I algebra. And then the prismatic side of R relative to A as objects given by, uh, again, by these diagrams R mapping via Yota to B mod J, where uh, and B mod J reduces to B for B J a prism uh, bounded. which lives over A mod I. And Yota is, of course, a morphism of, um, of A mod I algebras. Then the morphisms are given by morphisms of prisms. Compatible with, which are compatible with Yota. And with the structure uh, map to A. It's compatible also with, with A going to... Yes, uh, morphisms of prisms over uh, A mod I. Exactly. And then covers are given by uh, faithfully flat maps of prisms. But you also have to allow finite disjoint unions. This is to have the, uh, even for this risky topology, you need 
not just covered by a single object, but let's uh, say something is, is a disjointed yes. thing, then you, you have to add this to the... So I want to take the Grotendieck topology generated by these faithfully flat maps of prisms and then these Tsariski, um these disjoint unions. And so the boundedness assumption of a, of a prisms in the test category uh, in the prismatic side actually implies that the resulting cohomology won't depend on the choice of, of the topology, so we could equally take again uh, the topology where the covers are given by isomorphisms. And the reason is that again the boundedness implies like classically completeness and then it uh, implies uh, faithfully flat descent for PI complete modules. And then using this one can check that the prismatic homology does not uh, depend on this topology. And so, similar to yesterday, we are of course interested in the cohomology of the prismatic structure sheaf. And so, uh, again, its value on an object like this is given by B. And of course, we also have a reduced one, which records the B mod J. And so now, in contrast to yesterday, we also have an absolute version and it's the same just forgetting the, uh, the base prism A mod I. And so then I want to use the notation uh, prism. And so what do I mean? I mean there, uh, we just don't require B mod J to be a prism over A mod I, and so R is just any ring, and so this directly yields this definition of the absolute prismatic side. And so, uh, following what I've presented yesterday, we have to check uh, some things in order to be able to prove something about the prismatic homology. So, for example, we have to analyze products in the prismatic side in order to also get some Czech nerve argument going. But this uh, needs one uh, critical property for morphisms of prisms, which is called rigidity. Namely, if A to I, AI to DJ is a morphism of prisms, then actually i times b is equal to j. Okay. So why is this true? The proof is actually easy. Okay. Okay, first one, first of all, one can reduce by some inter risky localization to the case that both ideals, say, are principal. And so then we know by assumption I maps at least into J, and so this implies that D can at least be written as U times D prime for U some element in B. And we want to see that this element is a unit. And so we can now calculate. So delta of D is equal to u to the p times delta of d prime plus d prime to the p times delta of u plus p times delta of u delta of d prime. So that's exactly the formula how delta behaves with respect to products. And so now one can observe that this term here by the j adic completeness of b and the p adic completeness actually lies in the radical of B, and so something is there for a unit, if and only if it's a unit modulo that thing. But now uh, we know that this thing is a unit, and so this implies that U must be a unit.
Okay. So why is this rigidity important? Namely, you say in the risk localization, just not the risk localization. Pardon? Why the in in the risk? Um. Uh, what was the reason? Value? Because you're also too many things. I mean, it's, it's it's just like I mean, you you have a closed subset at, and somehow it's one plus i. You you, you invert one plus i somehow. It's it's not. I mean, ah, okay, so I you have finitely many. I think the idea is that you can either use local ring at all points where p and i vanishes and do it for each of them. So you need the general thing that about localization of delta rings, but to do it there. or what you said is that you want to have finitely, so maybe finitely many uh, uh, fine locally closed subsets and you kind of the risky localize around each and in the sense of in, like inverting something, I mean you have to invert uh, something like 1 plus i, like you said, and then it's in. Anyway, I guess if once you invert something, you also need to invert delta or something. Well, it, it is automatic because some the, the, the people <coughs> will Well, not automatic, that, that's why you need in. But like if A is inverted, phi A is not automatically inverted. I think this, a bit, uh, this is the reason, if I remember correctly. But, uh, okay. Uh, so. Okay. So why, why is this rigidity uh, useful? So namely, it has the corollary uh, that on the prismatic sides uh, they have non-empty products. So, and these are calculated by prismatic envelopes. Namely, say, so yesterday uh, in, in the products, we were forced to adjoin elements like J over P or J over T. And so in this case, in the general case, one missed by the rigidity force to adjoin elements like j over d, where d is a generator of uh, i. And so... And that, is it easy to see that you still get bounded things when you do this? Yes, I will, I will give a precise theorem that one has to prove about these prismatic envelopes after mentioning the main theorem. So, stay tuned. So, I now want to mention uh, when this uh, amazing theorem of Bartholze, which uh, um, gives a lot of uh, nice properties of a prismatic cohomology. So, assume that R is smooth over A mod I. And define R gamma of prism to be the cohomology of the relative uh, prismatic side. So here I maybe should also say that A i is some fixed bounded prism. And so the the prismatic cohomology is defined, of course, as the cohomology on the prismatic side of the prismatic structure sheaf. And so that's like uh, in commutative algebra in the derived infinity category of uh, P, uh, PI complete modules over A. And so it's also equipped with an endomorphism phi, which comes just from the endomorphism phi that exists on the prismatic structure sheaf. And now, one has the various uh, comparison theorems. And so the first is, say, the crystalline comparison. Namely, if i is generated by p, then the crystalline cohomology 
of R relative to A is isomorphic to the prismatic cohomology up to some Frobenius twist. So this is a generalization of the statement that I uh, discussed yesterday. And it's a generalization because here AI could be a general crystalline prism. And then the second uh, comparison is the hot state comparison. Uh, which has the following. So if one considers the cohomology on the prismatic side of the reduced prismatic structure sheaf, then this is canonically isomorphic to the uh, differentials of R over A mod I, but twisted, Brachesian twisted. And so what is what does this Brachesian twist refer to? So it's tensoring over A mod I with I mod I squared to the power, say, minus star. So here I mod I, I squared is by the invertibility of I is an, as like a locally, is a line bundle over A mod I. And so therefore we can make sense of, also of the negative tensor powers. And so why does this uh, Brachesian twist appear? Uh, it appears just if we want to construct this canonical comparison map as last time when we are forced uh, to consider uh, in this case a sequence like this. And so therefore the connecting map from uh, from the cohomology of a reduced prismatic sheaf to um, uh, like the Bockstein uh, lens in cohomology with coefficients in i mod i squared. Okay, but this can we can pull out of the cohomology and then um, uh, we exactly get the morphism from the twisted differentials to this cohomology. And so yesterday that gadget was canonically trivialized by T respectively P. But this does not work in the general case. Okay, then there exists the DRAM comparison. So, and what does it say? So, one can recover the DRAM cohomology of R relative to A mod I as the R gamma of a prismatic cohomology uh, but Frobenius twisted. So I map, um, I Frobenius twisted and then reduce modulo I. And this recovers the uh, DRAM cohomology. And then the fourth specialization is etal cohomology. So uh, assume that A is perfect, which for example rules out this Broekisian case. So why do you write something over, over the tensor sign? You write something that's completed tensor product? Or? Uh, yes. And I should also derive it, I guess. It's, uh, ah, it's, it's just in the, in the kind of <coughs> complete set in the center. Yes. And so assume that A is perfect and uh, let X eta be the generic fiber of uh, spectrum of R, 
Okay, implicitly I assumed that R should be P completely smooth over A mod I, and so spiff of R is a periodic formal scheme. And so then, one can calculate the etal cohomology of a generic fiber with coefficients in Z mod Pn as the um, prismatic homology, but this time now uh, specialized to A modulo P to Vn and then inverted the ideal I. But that's not enough. Namely, one also has to take the Frobenius fixed points for the action of the Frobenius on that guy. And of course, here the, the Frobenius fixed points are, uh, are the derived ones. And so, one, uh, and so in order to make sense, one, like the ideal I is in general not stable under the Frobenius, but at least modulo P2VN, uh, this subset, like this localization is stable, and so therefore one also has a Frobenius here. And then as a last property, the prismatic homology commutes with base change in the prism AI. This is again for smooth things, so or otherwise you have to, when you mention you have something that I, ah. Like, uh, I want to mention this later, so here it's only for, I mentioned it only for a smooth AI algebra, yeah. but after setting up the derived prismatic cohomology, one can also extend this to all R. And in the last one, commute with beds and what is the assumption on, on the R? It's again smooth. In these statements, R was always assumed to be P completely smooth over A mod I. And so, following what I've presented yesterday, like in order to understand the prismatic homology, one needs to understand these prismatic envelopes. And so here, the key technical input that has to be proven is the following. Uh, so assume I is a principal and assume that P is uh, P I completely flat uh, delta A algebra, meaning it's also equipped with a delta structure compatible with the one on A and Assume, say that J is an uh, idea generated by D and some elements x1 to xr with xi to xr pi completely regular. So what does this mean? So um, in the case where PI or PD um, is a regular sequence, this would just mean that PD, XI, X1 up to XR form a regular sequence. But if, uh, if a prism is not transversal, then this means that, okay, if you look at the cultural complex for the full sequence, including P and D, then this defines a, a flat um, animated uh, ring over the cultural complex for P and D. And then uh, the prismatic envelope It's okay, I don't understand. So you, you want which map to be? Uh so, say we have the causal complex for A, 
and uh, v sequence PD. Yes. And when this maps to v uh, causal complex for P uh, and v sequence PD x1 up to xr and this map. Yes. And so when the prismatic envelope um, P J over I. Uh, so what do I mean by prismatic envelope? It should satisfy this universal property that I've mentioned last time, adapted to the situation here of P and J. It's again given by uh, the thing that one would like it to be, namely it's given by adjoining to P the elements x i over d, x r over d. And so, uh, again, these elements are freely adjoined in delta rings to P. And so, moreover, this prismatic uh, envelope Uh, is uh, again pi completely flat over a and commutes with base change. In AI. And so in particular this implies that uh, this prismatic envelope is again bounded and so therefore uh, one has nicely behaved products uh, in the uh, in the prismatic side for a smooth A mod algebra. And so, I have a question: Why do you require the map of the this in flat? I mean, otherwise the statement is not true. Do you have a counterexample? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I uh, like. Uh, like a degenerate case, say, would be that, um, say, x1 is equal to d, and I think if you then freely adjoin, uh, if you freely adjoin that element, then you get d torsion, and then the flatness, for example, cannot hold. But, so, when you want to form a product in the prismatic side, so you, you take two, let's say, in the relative one, so you take two, Six, and you take, take the tensor product, and then you have to take a prismatic envelope. But why do you know that you have all those this condition uh, with the axis? How do you need something to be smooth to to turn the axis? Yeah. So the way how this key technical statement enters in the proof here is that in this theorem, R is assumed to be smooth, and then if we again take um, uh, say some free delta ring with a set to R, then uh, we only need to understand the uh, resulting Czech nerve for this surjection. And so in this, uh, in this case, one has these, uh, uh, these properties, say after some localization, that the prismatic envelopes are calculated in this way. So this key technical statement is enough to control the Czech nerve entering in the proof of this uh, Only for particular things. Yes. So the corollary is saying that some sites is non-empty product. In general, probably you can construct it as a universal property, but you you lose the like proving that it's bounded and things like this. You lose. Yes. Yes. Okay. <coughs> and so. Uh, I mean, with prismatic uh, cohomology, it has all these very nice specializations. But what is uh, what is maybe fascinating about the prismatic cohomology is that it's at the same time also concrete. And so I don't want to speak further about the proof of these things. I may I, I want to say something about the proofs how one can prove these statements uh, tomorrow. Uh, now I want to explain why still the prismatic cohomology is something concrete and for this I want to mention another theorem which identifies prismatic cohomology with Q Dirham cohomology and so this only works in, in a particular case which is V1 
uh, for the cyclotomic prism. So, so I can recall it's given by this ring with the I degenerated by the P, a Q analog of P. And so more generally, we have the Q analog of N, which is defined to be Q to the N minus uh, one divided by Q minus one. And then I want to consider, say, maybe the first uh, very concrete example, namely, I consider R to be given by Zp modulo uh, uh, Zp and then Tate algebra and Tt inverse. So note that this is not an A mod I algebra, but I will come to this. So, and of course, with Rubinus sends Q to Q to the P. And so, let me now uh, set R1 uh, to be uh, the tensor product, like of R over Zp with uh, A mod I. So this is given by Zp adjoint uh, primitive p fruit and then t plus or minus one. And so this thing has a net, like a, like not natural in a mathematical sense, a lift to um, uh, Uh, to A, namely we can just adjoin here, we can look at A and then T plus or minus one and we uh, require the delta structure here to be given by uh, T maps to T to the P. And in this case... Wait, what's the sub superscript of T? This one? Yeah, no, 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 uh, on P, like uh, T, is it I and then completion or what's the superscript? Plus minus one. Ah. Minus one. Plus minus one. Just right oh. the end. Okay, that's it. And so now uh, theorem of Bartholz uh, says the following. Uh, so the prismatic homology of this ring R one, which is uh, which is almost the same as R, um, can be calculated as the QDRAM uh, complex of R tilde over, over A. And so what is this? So here one has to note the QDRAM complex, it's not the, it does, it's not similar to the T or P DRAM complex appearing yesterday, so it denotes something different. Namely, uh, it's given in this case by a concrete two-term complex, um, which has the following form. So it's not just the DRAM complex and I multiply the differential by Q, but instead one looks at a different complex using the Q uh, differential. And so the, here, dqt is just a formal variable. And so that guy is a free module over R tilde. And so the Q differential of some uh, power series here, Ft, is defined to be Fqt minus F of t over Qt minus uh, t. And so, uh, times d q. So that's a concrete complex. And so 
this um, so this Q derivative has the property that the derivative of t to the n is uh, the Q analog of n times t to the n minus 1 times dqt. And so this implies that the Dram complex uh, is over there is just isomorphic to the following concrete complex. So I have to take a completed direct sum over all n and z of a times uh, t to the n. Then I multiply with, uh, with the Q analog of n to the um, uh, completed sum over n and z of a times t to the n times dqt over t. So if I write it in this way, then uh, this operator is just really like a diagonal matrix. And so here this term can also be called dq of log t. And so I think it's uh, very instructive in order to compare these two theorems, namely, um, okay, the claim is that this complex there calculates the prismatic homology, and then it also has to have all these specializations. And so, for example, the Dram comparison So the DRAM comparison can be seen explicitly, namely, in order to um, namely, so what we have to do in order to get the DRAM uh, comparison, so here, by the definition, we should mod out the inverse image of, um, of I under the Frobenius. And so this means in this case uh, that we can uh, get the DRAM comparison by first reducing modulo Q minus 1. And so then it's just the observation that N is congruent to this Q analog of N modulo Q minus 1. And then this whole complex just reduces to the DRAM complex of the lift. So, the hot state uh, comparison uh, is uh, also explicit, mean, meaning you have this concrete complex, you mod out um, the Q analog of P, and then there will be this term will split up in something which is acyclic. This is the case where N uh, is uh, not divisible by P, and then we uh, the remaining part will identify with the um, with the hot state cohomology. Um, yes, so that's equally explicit. And so I also want to mention the following. So uh, one could wonder whether one of these two statements that I've mentioned last time uh, could be true, namely that in the case there exists some smooth lift that one can calculate the, uh, the uh, prismatic homology via some, uh, via some basically Dram complex. But in, that's not possible uh, given the et al comparison theorem, at least not if one takes into account like an E-infinity structure. Because when the, like, the E-infinity structures on the et al cohomology, they are uh, they are not trivial, and so therefore uh, this complex cannot be represented by um, by uh, a commutative uh, differential graded algebra. At least if the uh, if the prism is transversal. I mean, of course, if the uh, generic fiber is empty. Uh, for example, if R is of characteristic P, then that's possible, and we have seen that this is actually happening, but in the general case, one cannot find such a nice statement like from last time. And so, and concretely, one can uh, 
uh, that gadget that I've written here, it, it has the structure of a DG algebra, but this is not a uh, graded commutative. And so um, this manifests itself in the following concrete formula. So if one looks at this Q derivative of F times uh, G, then that's the same as F of QT of uh, Q derivative of G of T plus GT times uh, Q derivative of FT. And so one sees that here, because of this appearance of a Q here, that's not a commutative uh, uh, DG algebra. And so, given also the presentation from yesterday, maybe the first three comparisons seem plausible, right? I mean, here at least we have a map, and then the crystalline comparison I sketched a bit how one proves it in characteristic P and so on, and then the DRAM comparison, at least in the crystalline case, uh, it reduces to the fact that the crystalline cohomology modulo P is the RAM cohomology. Uh, but the etal cohomology is maybe the most surprising thing, especially given that the prismatic cohomology can be calculated by such a concrete complex. And so I want to explain how, how one can see the etal comparison explicitly in this case. And so I let, first of all, the etal comparison works over a perfect prism, and so first of all, let us pass to the perfection of the cyclotomic prism. And so, concretely, this means that we have to take uh, PIF roots out of uh, Q, and so, and then complete, and then we can also write this actually as the uh, is the uh, A inf of ZP cycle, where ZP cycle is the completed uh, uh, P cyclotomic extension of this thing. And here the element Q would map to the Teichmüller of epsilon, where epsilon uh, is a P power compatible system of uh, primitive um, roots uh, of unity. And so, like, then let me note the following. So mm, the element Q minus 1 is seen as an element in L, which I define to be A infinity modulo P. And when I invert I, that's actually invertible. OK, why is this the case? Because if I look at the Q analog of P and reduce it modulo P, then this is isomorphic to Q minus 1 to the power P minus 1. And so um, this implies that this prismatic complex here is isomorphic to the following two-term complex. So again, ah, I, I have to base change here. To uh, to L. So is it just two term, just a two-term complex in this case? I, I write down the 2 complex. Yes. So I I write down now the base change of this prismatic complex, which I've written up over there has this concrete form, but I base change it to uh, to L. And so this has the following description. So. That's the same as a uh, Banach, uh, Banach space uh, 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 sum of L times uh, T to the N times. And now what I do is I rewrite the differential, the Q analog of N, just as Q to the N minus 1. But this means that I have to add here the denominator uh, Q minus 1. And so I can do this just because Q minus 1 is invertible. And so let me denote this complex by K dot. And so one can now uh, see the following. So first of all, uh, the Q on this former variable 
the uh, action of phi uh, should be defined as follows. So it should be given by dq of t to the p. And so this identifies with pq times t to the p minus 1 times dqt. And so this implies that actually phi of this dq log t over q minus 1, that this is actually equal to itself. In other words, uh, this, yeah, this element is fixed under phi. I mean, dqt is just a formal variable which we introduced in uh, in in speaking about this q uh, derivative, and so uh, here I define the action of phi on it in this way. So maybe I think I don't understand the question. Okay. Uh, so, mm, so the second observation is now the following. So uh, we are interested in the derived phi invariance on this complex K. And so now something which happens is that uh, we can take the completed co-limit over phi. So if we just let me first just take the co-limit over phi, but taking the co-limit over phi of this complex, it does not change the phi invariance, more or less by definition, right? Because phi is one on the phi invariance. Okay, but then one also has to observe that one can also pass to uh, completion. And so, um, so what is the result of, uh, of also completing this co-limit? So one has to complete it in a Banach sense. And so uh, it's the following. So it's a completed tensor product. Uh, it's a completed direct sum. But now uh, with n going through z1 over p and then l times t to the n and q to the n minus 1. So note that here this expression makes sense because q also has arbitrary p to the n roots. And here we have this element dq uh, log t over q minus 1. And then I have to take the phi invariance. And now um, we want to relate this complex to the uh, to the ethyl cohomology of the generic fiber. And so what one can observe is actually that this complex here, that this calculates the R gamma on the pro ethyl side of the generic fiber with coefficients in the tilted structure sheaf. I mean, how do you calculate the Okay, and then in the end we have to take the fine variance. But how do you calculate the pro etal cohomology of the uh, of the uh, generic fiber with coefficients in the tilted structure sheaf? So first of all, uh, one uses almost purity uh, to see that this pro etal cohomology uh, vanishes on affinoid perfectoids in the side. But then we can calculate the pro etal cohomology by using like the standard pro etal cover, which just means extract um, uh, p to the n's root out of t, and then look at the global sections on uh, look at the sections of the tilted structure sheaf on that cover. But these are exactly these guys, and then uh, this will calculate the 
but then we also have to take the action of, uh, of ZP1. But the action of ZP1, then the continuous, uh, so we have to calculate the continuous cohomology of the action of ZP1, but this results in this two-turn complex, where this guy is given by, uh, comes from the action of ZP1. So why define variants don't change under completed co-limit? You say it doesn't change under co-limit, but why? Here you complete iadically, I suppose, also. Yes. So how, why does it change? Also, um, this reduces to the same statement modulo p. And then uh, one uses, uh, in the end, let's say, phi of d is equal to d to the p. And so then if d is topological nepotent, then from here when uh, uh, one deduces that one can, by passing to the completion, <laughs> does not change the phi invariance. Okay, so here we have now uh, uh, concretely uh, seen the appearance of a proital cohomology with coefficient and the tilted uh, structure sheaf. But then uh, we have the Artin Schreier sequence for, uh, for the tilted structure sheaf. And so this implies that the phi invariance of this, I mean, I can pull them inside here, this uh, calculates the, the Etal cohomology of the generic fiber with FP coefficients by the Artin Schreier sequence. And actually, the uh, strategy for proving the Etal cohomology of the Etal comparison theorem in general is along these lines. So one passes to the perfection completed way, then one identifies uh, files it with, say, the pro Etal cohomology of the tilted structure sheaf and then in the end reduces the statement to an Artin Schreier sequence. I mean, this also works if one, say, replaces here fp by z mod p to the n. So this is not yet the primitive comparison theorem, which holds in the proper case, it uses finiteness. So is this all in the non-proper smooth case? That's also in the non-proper. The only in put from Scholz's work is this almost purity theorem, which implies the vanishing of the proital cohomology on a phenoid perfectoid with coefficients in the tilted structure sheet. Okay. So, uh, this is what I wanted to say about the Zetal comparison theorem. And uh, next, I want to speak about the derived prismatic. Um, cohomology. And so the interest is that, okay, the prismatic uh, side yields very good answers for smooth algebras, but the derived prismatic cohomology, it, it works for all A mod I algebras. And so the definition is as follows. So uh, we fix some bounded prism. AI, and then we define uh, the derived prismatic homology as a functor on derived uh, P complete animated AI algebra, and it takes values in the complete uh, category of A, and it's defined uh, as the left Kahn extension. of the prismatic homology, which is defined on p-complete uh, smooth A mod I algebras. In other words, when given some, uh, some animated algebra, one has to simplicially resolve it by, um, by possibly uh, int uh, smooth A mod I algebras, and then one looks at the corresponding totalization of the prismatic homology, and this um, in, the, in the completed uh, derived infinity category here for A, and this calculates the derived prismatic homology. And so, 
then this has the following properties. So, yes. We've completed uh, filtered co limits. And so, statements like this can be very well accessed through the following observation. Namely, we can also left Kahn extend the uh, Postnikov um, filtration on uh, the prismatic homology on smooth algebras. So if I take canonical truncations of this prismatic homology, this uh, yields uh, an increasing exhaustive n indexed uh, filtration mm. written like fill n conjugate on the derived prismatic homology uh, with associated graded given by, uh, by some derived exterior power of uh, the p-completed cotension complex of r over i but when Broekisin twisted uh, in degree minus i and shifted in degree minus i. And so this um, statement just follows from the hot state comparison theorem uh, in, in the theorem over there. And here the cotangent complex, of course, um, arises because it's by definition the left Kahn extension of uh, differentials. Uh, so why i and n, it will be the same in, you have i... Ah, sorry, yes, that's uh, an n here. So do you want to reduce the prismatic homology mod i? Pardon? It should be Hodge-Tate and not prismatic mm -hmm. homology. It should be Hodge-Tate. The conjugate filtration is a filtration on the Hodge-Tate homology. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, and the twist goes outside of right? Ah, uh, yes, uh, you mean this one, so, okay. Good, and so... I And for example, this commutation with filtered co-limits um, uh, by PI completeness, it reduces um, it reduces to checking the same statement. Um, ah, yes. uh, it, re uh, it reduces to checking the state same statement for the reduced uh, prismatic uh, cohomology. And so there, uh, using this, uh, this filtration, it reduces to commutation of the p-completed cotangent complex with filtered co-limits. And then, uh, another property that uh, is very useful is the following. So, um, the functor from R to the derived prismatic homology of R modulo A it satisfies quasi-syntomic descent. And so, let me be precise what, the, what this would mean. So, let R be a p-complete ring uh, with uh, bounded p-infinity torsion. Then R is called quasi-syntomic. 
if uh, the cotension complex of R relative to ZP and the p-completed one uh, is of p-complete tor amplitude. in the interval minus one zero, meaning that whenever one uh, tensors this uh, derived with some p torsion module over r, then this is concentrated in degrees minus one and zero. And then secondly, um, a morphism r to r prime is called quasi-syntomic if like the same tor amplitude condition holds for of the co completed cotent complex of R prime over R and uh, R to R prime is uh, P completely flat. And so then the statement for this quasi syntomic descent is then the following. So if R to R prime is a quasi syntomic cover, Uh, with tracing of uh, our bullet. And if we also say, assume that A mod I to R is quasi syntomic, then the prismatic homology of R modulo A um, identifies with the uh, limit over delta of the um, prismatic homology of the terms of uh, this Chechenov. And so the proof here reduces, uh, reduces to, the, uh, to checking the same statement for the cotangent complex, which even satisfies flat descent, but one needs the quasi-syntomicness and so therefore the bound on the P, uh, on the cotangent complex in order to, uh, to um, get from the statement of the reduced prismatic homology with its filtration, the statement here. I mean, one has to commute some co-limit with a limit. And so this yields a very powerful strategy, and this strategy also appeared already in Matthew's talk yesterday, and so it's uh, the following. So it's a powerful strategy uh, to access uh, the derived... Sorry, uh, Johannes, I mean, Johannes, one question. I mean, do you also assume that R and R prime are quasi syntonic? Here? No, but I'm, I'm assuming that here A mod I to R is quasi syntonic, and then also R to R prime is quasi syntonic. Oh, A mod I to R is quasi -syntomic. Okay. Yes. Then, then I don't think it's true without some bound. Yeah, I think it's false. Uh, say again, which statement is false? I think you need like some quasi syntomic property of A mod I, or at least like that. That is. But here the cotangent complexes are all relative to A mod I. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I missed the last assumption. Yes. Okay. <laughs> And so the strategy is uh, the following. So one reduces to smooth AI algebras uh, using the left Kahn extension. And so one has to prove a statement of, for smooth A mod I algebras. But now one can reduce uh, uh, via quasi-syntomic descent uh, to something that one could call large A mod I algebras R via quasi-syntomic descent. And so a large, I mean a typical quasi-syntomic cover is one where you extract a p-fruit of, of some element. And so when doing this very often um, leads a large uh, A mod I algebra, namely, it's an, you require that the map A mod I to R is quasi syntomic 
and there exists a surjection a mod i and from a mod i adjoint variables x, uh, j and with have, which have uh, arbitrary p2v and fruits r. So in particular uh, there's a large a supply of elements in R which admits p-power compatible systems of elements and here this implies that the cotension complex of R over A mod I is actually um, is p complete if I shift it once then this is given by some p complete um, completely flat a module over R. And so this has the consequence uh, that we derived a prismatic homology of R relative to A is concentrated in degree zero. And then actually um, one, one can show that it acquires, so it's just a usual ring, and one can show that the Frobenius on the, on this, uh, on this derived prismatic cohomology here actually, uh, is underlying some delta structure, and that this guy is actually a prism, and then it's in fact initial in the a prismatic side of R over A. So in this uh, uh, case, it's um, uh, quite concrete. Uh, in order to see this, I mean, are you this cotangent complex, it means it sits only in degrees minus one and zero, so it's sufficient to see that the contribution in degree zero vanishes. But then that's just the observation that you can check this modulo p. But when modulo p, you have each element had mits a p fruit, but this means that the differential of this element is zero. So when you say initial in, do, do you take which category you take? So the site is like the opposite of the category of algebra. You take the category. Ah, yes, uh, that's maybe a good... Of algebra, maybe it's initial, but on the side, in the side is a lot of oh. <laughs> And as a sample application, I want to end by introducing the Nygaard filtration. And so it's the following theorem. So say, we take R any, say, P and your P complete animated A mod I algebra, then there exists a natural filtration fill I N on the uh, Frobenius twist of the prismatic homology. Uh, such that the associated graded for this filtration identifies with uh, the i-th filtration in the conjugate filtration of the 
um, reduce prismatic homology and then uh, Braghisian twisted by I. And so if R is smooth over A mod I, then actually the relative Frobenius of uh, the of the prismatic complex for R over M mod I uh, induces an isomorphism of uh, that gadget with the decalage of the prismatic homology. So the decalage with respect to I. And so the strategy uh, for proving this uh, is the one that I've mentioned there. And so therefore, as a sketch, so if R is large, so it, su it suffices to do some clever construction in the case where R is large. And then one can actually directly define this filtration, namely, it's defined to be the inverse image under the Frobenius of the i adic filtration on uh, this ring which is given by the prismatic homology. Of course, then one has to check uh, this property and which implies that this filtration is satisfies quasi syntomic descent for large algebras. And then one can use this to define a filtration in the smooth case. And then it will be left Kahn extended again by this property. And then one has control over it in general. And so in order to check these statements, one can actually assume one can further reduce to R's which have a particular simple form and then it ends up being a calculation in this ring. So I want to finish with a consequence of this existence of the Nygaard filtration. In particular, this implies the DRAM uh, comparison theorem. So uh, how does this go? So, and here uh, are is smooth over A mod I. Ah, maybe I should also say a word how one checks this property in the smooth case. Uh, like given this filtration, one uh, gets the factorization of the Frobenius map over the decalage. And then checking that this is an isomorphism eventually reduces to the, uh, to the crystalline case under base change. And then here one can use um, then some classical results. And so, but in order, okay, so now this property here implies the DRAM comparison, namely um, by some general property of uh, the decalage functor, namely if I reduce it, the decalage of a complex modulo i, then I get the um, uh, the cohomology of uh, derived reduction modulo i with a uh, Bockstein differential. But in this case, this is just like the cohomology of the reduced prismatic cohomology of r over a. Okay, and then one also has to introduce a twist. But then by the hot state comparison theorem, this just identifies with the differentials of r over i untwist uh, without the twist. I mean, the twist here cancels with the twist that one has to introduce for the L eta. And so then one also, by the construction of a comparison map for the hot state comparison, this complex here that one gets is the DRAM complex with a DRAM differential. And so therefore, this Nigelt filtration implies the anti-RAM uh, comparison. So in the first ter term, there's an A mod I in the same way. Yes, thanks. Yeah, uh, that's it, uh, what I wanted to present today.
questions? Uh, I return to the previous uh, remarks about the products in the site. So it's easier to take products to some particular thing given by uh, three uh, delta rings when they are completed and so on. And so you, but when you take the product, I suppose you studied this basic fact with finitely many elements, but it seems that when you do this, you will have a secret, infinite sequence or not. In the, when you take a product of yeah, when, when one has to pass to the co-limit, to a filtered co-limit of a statement that I've, uh, that I've mentioned there. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.